Our scripture this morning is from Ephesians 5, 21 through 33. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of the body. For this reason, a man will leave his mother and father and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Heather. Good morning and welcome again to Redeemer Lincoln Square. It is good to be back. Um, it was uh, good to be away, too, but it's good to be back. And we've been doing a short mini-series. Mark started us off last week, and today we get to the topic of marriage. Small little topic I've never preached on before, but here we are. And um, this topic is actually, marriage is one of the things that we're culturally divided on. 40% of Americans think marriage is obsolete. Over 52% of adults over the age of 18, men and women, are not married, and that's actually the highest it's ever been when it comes uh, to being adults and not in marriage. And therefore, there's lots, lots of people out there going, you know what, that's, that's what's wrong with America. We need to have more marriages. We need to encourage marriage. Other people say, no, let's just get rid of the whole thing. Who's actually right? Today's passage, I think, is speaking to us to tell us whether we're a Christian or not, whether we're married or not, whether we've been divorced or separated or whatever status we are, we probably don't understand marriage as defined by the Bible. That what, it's, what it actually is trying to tell us is that marriage has a purpose, but it's a purpose that we really, really have a hard time getting at and understanding. And so what I want to do today is I want to look at this passage, I want to look at it in three parts. What marriage isn't, what marriage is, and where marriage goes. So what marriage is, what marriage isn't, and then where does marriage actually go? So look at our text, first verse. It says here, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Uh, fun fact, in Greek, the word to submit, the verb is actually not here. This is, a, uh, if you know your grammar, this is a participle that's actually modifying a long run-on sentence. Paul does this sometimes. That started back in verse 18, talking about what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And what he's doing is, the context is not, hey, I've talked about the Holy Spirit, and now I'm going to talk to you about marriage. What he's doing is, is like, hey, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to have the gospel in your life, means this when it comes to your marriage. And it means to submit, or I guess the literal translation means to be submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's what it's saying here. And so what I, the first thing I want to point out of what marriage isn't, here's what marriage isn't. Marriage is not you complete me. Nowhere in this text, nowhere in the Bible does it actually say marriage is, quote, you complete me. And I'm, I'm referencing the, you know, I'm going to date myself now. I'm referencing the 1994 movie uh, Jerry Maguire where Tom Cruise plays Jerry. And he, the pivotal moment of the movie is he comes home, he looks Dorothy in the eye and says, you complete me. Well, he doesn't do the finger, but you <laughs> complete me is what he does. You complete me. And what he's saying is, is that at some level, marriage, you're, the, the other person, I need you, I'm dependent on you for my identity, I'm dependent on you for completion. That that's actually a very modern understanding 
of marriage, that marriage is about personal fulfillment. It's about my happiness, about my joy, which is why, by the way, when I'm not getting the happiness, when I'm not getting the joy, that's why we get out of marriage. It's a very modern understanding. But here's the thing. Traditional culture says this. Marriage is for stability and it's for social status, to have kids and to have a, a firm foundation and know who you are. What's I, 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 I just had this thought this week. Both the traditional marriage and modern marriage actually both see marriage as you complete me. You're being completed by, hey, this is for my own emotional, personal uh, happiness, or my stability and my you know, family unit. Both, though, are about me still. It's about, it's about you complete me. If you go about marriage this way, here's what you're going to do. You're either going to look for a spouse that's like a low-maintenance person, somebody that you have identified your grid of like 6'5 and blue eyes and trust fund. <laughs> or, or, you know what, so low maintenance. Or you're going to find somebody who's high maintenance. Who, why are you going to find somebody high maintenance? Because you're the kind of person who, who needs somebody to need you. And you're going to enjoy that because that's your thing. Or, if you're coming from a more traditional culture, you're going to try to find somebody who you can bring home to mom and dad that they're going to value. And then you can have kids and if, if you can't have kids and then you're going to be you know, stable and have that. But each time what that's, what's going to happen is it's still going to be you going into marriage to be completed. And I think therefore both modern and traditional marriage puts way too much pressure on marriage. What if they disappoint you? And by the way, they will. What if you disappoint them and you will? What if you can't have kids what if you never get married? What if you get married and it's not as great as you thought it was? And this is the, all these things are actually real. We, what happens when culture overemphasizes marriage and puts more pressure on it than it was originally designed for, of course it doesn't, it's not going to work out. When you think you're going to find the one true person and then it's going to be okay, it's not going to work. I actually think the reason why culture, one of the reasons why culture is so pessimistic towards marriage is because when you put your hope in it, when you put your all in it, when this is going to be the thing, and then inevitably it doesn't end up being that, of course you get pessimistic about it, and you think it's, it's obsolete. And so what I think we need to do is when you look ourselves in the mirror, what we need to see is we need to see somebody who has all the gifts and all these talents and all the flaws. And if you get in marriage, the other person on the other side is going to have the same gifts and talents and flaws, which means... They're going to let you down, and you're going to let them down, which means your spouse can't actually make you whole. They never could. It was never designed for that. I never watched the um, sitcom series Seinfeld uh, years ago. I'm, again, I'm dating myself. But I think it's on streaming, and I, I know all the young people are watching it here and there. And there's an ongoing theme where Jerry constantly gets out of relationships because she comes up with the most, most ridiculous reasons that like she's got man hands or she eats peas one at a time or uh, she completes his sentences and so he gets you know he gets out of it and we laugh and we joke but there's a part of us that maybe it's a little too hits a little too close to home maybe how many of us are disappointed with our spouses how many are disappointed with our so, our our marital status how many of us are picky about who we're going to get in relationship with. And the reason why is because we have the wrong view of marriage as you complete me in either the modern or the traditional view. I took uh, Sarah to go see, this is last week, I took her to go see Brent Goldstein, who plays uh, Roy Kent in Ted Lasso. It's, I, she says uh, Roy Kent's her spirit animal, so don't judge her for that. But he was doing stand-up comedy, and at one point in the, in the, in the, the evening, he, he looks out in the audience and says, well, who, who's married here? Who's married? And Sarah and I rose our, our hands, and he looks out, and he goes, how long have you guys been married? And we said, 22 years. And he had this, like, awkward pause of, like, okay, that's a lot longer than uh, for your age. He says, you guys look so young. And then he proceeded to kind of make fun of marriage and make fun of us. And he kind of, he shames us for being in marriage, and then he shamed himself as a single person to be not a marriage. And, I, and as I left, I was like, you know, this, this guy's brilliant, but he also, I think, puts his finger on something. I think a lot of us are filled with shame for not being married. I think a lot of us are filled with shame in how we act in our marriages. 
there's a lot of disillusionment. I think there's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of unfulfillment. But I think the Bible is saying in this text and overall that marriage was never designed to be the place where you get your validation, where you get your completion, where you get your awe, where you get your acceptance. It was never designed for that. And you say, Michael, how do you know that? How do I know that? Well, the guy writing this passage, Paul, was single. And in other places where he writes, he says, I hope more of you are actually single. I also know that the most complete person in all the universe who has ever walked the earth, Jesus, was single. And therefore, marriage should not be used to say you're complete. Christianity is clear. Marriage does not complete you. It can't complete you. And it was never designed to complete you. Okay, that's what marriage isn't. Fine. Then what is marriage for? Number two. This text says it's to serve each other. The word submit is all over this passage, to submit. It shows up 40 times in the New Testament. And it roughly means this. It means to arrange yourself under somebody else's authority. And so... When he uses this word here, what he's saying is this. He's saying when two people are Christians, when they're filled with the Holy Spirit, when the gospel's in their life, they're going to be humbled but affirmed in Christ. And the reason why that matters is because it changes then how you operate and how you see marriage. That it changes how you actually interact in marriage and how you approach it. Two I want to serve you. Why is that? Well, here it is. The message of Christianity holds two factors, two sides together that are never divorced, and that's this. One, you're a lot worse than you think that you are, even right now. That you are not as put together as you thought that you were. And there's nothing that you can do to fix that ultimately. No self-improvement system, no optimization that's going to get you there. Only by the death of the Son of God are you able to be saved. And yet at the same time, you are loved beyond the universe because the Son of God was willing to and wanted to die for you. You are that accepted. You are that loved. You are that sought after. And when you hold both of those things together at the same time, here's what happens. It humbles you because you're not as great as you thought you were. It it grounds you in reality At the same time, it lifts you up, and you can never get too down on yourself. You never get too too ashamed, because the God of the universe loves you like that. And when you hold those two things together, what you will feel is humble but secure. You will realize that you don't deserve anything, and yet you'll be amazed at all the things that you do actually get. And that, therefore, you'll be fulfilled and affirmed without an ego or pretension. And what it does then is this. In marriage, you don't need their praise. You don't need them to complete you because you already have his praise, because you already have completion in you. And you know what that does? The only thing left is you can serve. Go to our text, verse 22. Wives, it says, wives, submit to your husbands to be the head, to go before, to lead. And then it says, husbands, in verse 25, you're submitting too. The way you do it is the way Christ loved the church. You know what he did? He died. To himself. He died to, and submitted so that he, to serve holistically the church. And therefore, when we do that, we serve our, our wives in the same way. I know modern people hate this term submission. And the reason why they hate submission is because it has been used to abuse. It has been used to hurt other people. And yet, here's the thing. Submission is the basis of service. And service is the basis of love. And all love serves. If you don't want love, that's okay. You don't have to serve. If you don't want to serve, it's okay. You just don't, you just can't get love. Because the basis of love is service, which is why Paul roots it in marriage. Because what he's saying is, is the purpose of Christian marriage is this. Not saying, come and fulfill me. How can I fulfill you? Come and serve me. No, how can I actually serve you? Paul is saying that, and go to verse 33 towards the end. He's saying, if you're changed by the gospel, then what can happen is a husband is going to die to himself. He's not going to exploit or abuse you. 
and a wife is going to be able to submit and respect and, and love her husband in mutual service, submitting differently, but equally and similarly. In a healthy Christian marriage, here's what is happening then. It's not two people. This is, what, this is the problem. Two, in, in modern marriage or in traditional marriage, it's usually two people looking at each other. And, you know, if I had dolls, they'd be like smooching like that. But in Christian marriage, it's two people side by side, arm in arm, pulling each other in the same direction. Because what you're doing is this. You're saying, I see you and I see all your flaws. And most of those flaws are actually impacting me and hurting me. And at the same time, I see a glimpse of what the Lord is doing in your life, and I'm here for that. And I want to be part of that. And I want to see through what God is going to do in your life, even through me in your life. In other words, you love the person not just for who they are, you're loving them for who they could be. And so in mar- Christian marriage, you're actually saying, not just I love you now, it's, like, it's, not, it's, a, it's a future commitment to who you might be in the present. And so what does that mean practically? I'm getting all heady and and all ethereal. Let me make it really practical for you. Here's what it means. If you aren't married right now, don't marry somebody who doesn't share the same faith. Because A, their view of marriage, if it's not I'm here to serve you, it's going to be I'm here to serve me. And that is where exploitation happens. That is where problems happen. Not to say Christians don't do that, but I definitely know that when your marriage is not based on this, that will happen. Also, if the purpose of marriage is to see what God is doing in the other person's life, to see how the gospel is growing in the other person, if you don't marry somebody who is another believer, you can't do that. You can't actually be on the same mission, pulling each other in the same direction. And all the tensions will be this. It's going to be, where do you spend your money? You're going to have different goals for your money. Where are you going to have your values? You're going to have different values. How are you going to raise your kids? You're going to have different ways to want to raise your kids. Every single tension is because the basis of how you see reality and why you're even in this relationship is completely different. And therefore, don't do that. You're, I mean, um, my mom wrote an article. If you want to go to it, just Google Kathy Keller and, and marriage, and it'll, and it'll say, don't take my word for it. She's heard many, many stories of folks in marriages that are not of the same faith. And what is them happening is, you think you're lonely now, there's, there, you can actually get lonely, lonelier because there's nothing more lonely than being in a marriage where you're not on the same mission. If you are married, and marriage is about service, ask yourself this, are you actually fighting over how you can serve each other better? Let's say uh, tonight is eat takeout night, and you're, you're debating between Pizza Hut and Taco Bell. I know that's how most of your nights are like that, right? You're, you want Taco Bell, he or she wants Pizza, uh, pizza Hut. Who gets to win? In most modern marriages, or traditional, most modern marriages, it's like, well, it's, you basically fight it out. Traditional marriages, somebody's going to say, well, I deserve it. But in Christian marriage, here's what you should be doing. The wife should be saying, honey, what do you want? I so respect you, and I so care about your needs. I want what you want. And the husband should be saying, I want, you, I want to die to what I, what I need. I want to know what you need, and I want to serve that, and I want to care for you. So what do you want? And you will find if you're actually both doing that, you're going to come to decisions in a very different way. Are you actually doing that? Is, are you falling over each other to serve each other? Now, if you're not, you're saying in your head, oh, man, i got to try harder. i gotta, I got to serve better. i gotta, I got to do this better. You need to look back in our text and see that that's actually not what Paul says. Paul roots this service not in trying harder and trying better. He roots it in the faith. Notice every single time when he says, wives submit, it's um, as Christ is the head. When he says to to the man, hey, you need to love your wives just as Christ. Every time he goes back to what Christ did for you. In other words, you can only die to yourself if you realize he's died for you. You can only do for them if you realize what he's done for you. You can only serve them if you realize what, how he served you. To really serve another, you have to feel served. Then and only then can you say, I give my life for you. And not, I need you to give your life for me. Will you both do this equally? No. Let me just say right now, no, you won't. 
We always do it equally at the same time. No, you won't. Jesus knows about that too. But this is what Christian marriage is for. This is completely different. This is why nobody understands it. Because it's not the modern view. It's not the traditional view. It's not my life for me. It's my life for you. All right, last point. Where does marriage go? Most folks, most modern folks see marriage as a destination. I've, I've arrived. I've done it. Christianity, we've already shown you how it has a very different view about marriage. But I think the most radical thing about Christian marriage is this. It's not about marriage. It's not about itself. Go back, look at our text again. Go back to verse 31. And here Paul quotes Genesis 2, the basis for biblical marriage, which is two people radically different come together as one flesh. Now some of you go, aha, see, they're complete. You put them together. You're wrong, Mike. Read the next verse. The next verse says, but this is a great mystery. So what is that about? Well, it's a great mystery, profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. Huh? This whole time you're talking about wives and husbands and how they're supposed to serve each other, and actually you've been talking about Christ in the church? What Paul is doing here is he's saying this. He's saying this whole apparatus, this whole thing about marriage was never meant to point to itself. It was meant to point past itself to the way that Christ wants to have a relationship with the church, the way Christ wants to have a relationship with you. See, that's why it says, go back to the very first verse, submit to one another. How? Out of reverence for each other? No. Out of reverence for Christ. All this was meant to point to how he wants to relate to you. So here's the thing. If you're devastated about not being in marriage right now, if you're devastated because you are in a marriage right now, if you're somewhere in between because marriage is not giving you what you want because it wasn't designed for that, what this is trying to tell us is it was always meant to look past to Jesus and how he saw marriage and what he wanted with you. Now, to do a little bit of that, if you walk with me to find out how Jesus saw marriage, let's go back 2,000 years ago. How did marriage, how did Jesus actually see marriage? Back then, marriage was arranged marriages, wasn't it? But I did a little research on this. Did you know, even though there was arranged marriages, where basically the groom and the bride, their families got together and kind of put them together, you still had a choice. The groom would come over to the bride's house often multiple times to try to get to know each other. And if things were going well, the groom would offer, uh, the, the ceremony would offer a cup of wine to the bride-to-be. And if she accepted it, if she took a sip, it was like the proposal, and she was saying, yes, I, I'm, I'm, let's, let's do this. Well, what would happen then is immediately the groom would go back to his father's home and start building another room for where he and his bride would live. And often this is why these homes were like really huge because there's many generations and many different rooms. And what would happen is the father-in-law would come with the groom, would come over a bunch of times to ensure that the specifications were built up to the level that would be appropriate for for his daughter. And so he spent all this time building, and yet there was also this expectation, this waiting period of, when is the groom going to come back? Today, we always put all the focus on the bride in, in a lot of weddings, but then it was about the groom. Is the groom coming back? When will the groom come back? A lot of times people were wondering, will the groom come back? Have they moved on? Maybe he changed his mind. But then the groom comes back. And what Jesus is trying to say through that is that I'm that bridegroom. Many times in the Bible, Jesus calls himself, I'm the true groom. Who's going to come back for you? Who's going to bring you to, me, to himself? And, and he's building houses and spaces for us all to be there. And even though there's this huge buildup of when he's going to come back, he does come back. During the engagement tradition, again, this is 2,000 years ago, when... Even when, they're handing, when the groom is handing the, the wine to the bride, there was like this sort of coined phrase that the, the groom would say as she takes it. And this is what he would say rough, roughly. Say, bride-to-be, in my father's house are many rooms. And if it were not so, and if it were not so, why have I told you that I would go and prepare a place for you? And I go and prepare a place for you. I have done that. And I will come again, and I will take you to myself, 
that where I am, you shall also be. You know what's interesting? That's the exact phrase that Jesus uses in John chapter 14, talking to his disciples, when he's trying to tell them, don't worry, I'm coming back for you. I'm going to be here for you. Friends, I want you to know this. Many of you are hurt. You're impatient. Where's Jesus for me? I feel like he's abandoned me. I feel like he's left me. He's not coming back for me. He doesn't want me. Nobody else wants me either. I feel it's even more abandoned because I'm in these relationships. I'm in these spaces. When will you show up? Maybe he doesn't care. Maybe he doesn't love us. And what he's telling us here is he's building rooms. And he's preparing a place. So where I am, so shall you be. And he's doing everything to come back to us. And here's the question. Are you doing everything to get to him? Or have you started looking for other grooms? Have you started looking for other people, places, and things to fulfill you? Either inside of marriage or outside of marriage? And how are those things operating? How are those things working? I bet you in time you'll realize they won't. They can't work out. If you go one more chapter back to John 13, there's this great text where Jesus washes the disciples' feet. And this is what it says. It says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and he had come from God and was returning to God. And then the, I think one of the most profound passages in the Bible is right here. Because it says that Jesus, he's literally contemplating all the power he has. He's going to God, and he's come from God. And then this little word, two letters, it says, so. So he got up from the meal, and he took off his cloak and washed the feet of the disciples. Something no rabbi, somebody, no, no master would do that for his disciples. What I love about this is it was when Jesus was contemplating the nature of God, when he was contemplating the essence of who God was, he got up and served. And he was telling us this, is that the nature of God is service. The nature of God is to care and love and to submit. So God's not doing, he's not asking to do anything that he doesn't already do. And also when you do it, you're actually, if you're made in his image, you're actually living in line most in that moment with how you were created to be. Because that's who God is. Because he submits and serves. That is why Paul is saying service and submission is the essence of the gospel in you, which is why it's the essence of marriage. It's why he goes on in other, if we read more of Ephesians, he goes on in all the other relationship possibilities of how this works itself out. Only then can, whether you're single or married in this room today, if you have this in your life, you're gonna be able to serve even when you don't feel served. No wonder in, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 26, Jesus' disciples, they're fighting who's the greatest, who's gonna be at the right hand of, of Jesus. You know what Jesus does? He looks at all of them and he says this. He says, not so with you. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. He says, that's not what I want for you. I know that's how the world works. I know that's how all human relationships work. Tit for tat. You scratch my back, I scratch your back. I, you went to Taco Bell yesterday, I, could go to, I get to go to Pizza Hut today. But that's not how Jesus wanted us to live. If and only if Christ's love and service is ultimate in your life, will you have the wisdom to leave an abusive relationship because you don't need him or her for completion? Or give you the wisdom to stay in a hard relationship because they, even if they've hurt you and even though you've hurt them, that's what Jesus has done for you. And giving you the wisdom to know the difference. Only if you have his love and service in your life ultimate. Can you do that? And so here's what I want you to do. Think. If right now, if you are married and have always wanted to be, Jesus knows exactly what you feel like because you know why? He too is single, spending his time, can't wait to be married to the, to the church. He's been longing for that. Turn to him. If you're impatient, if you can't wait any longer, Jesus waited over 2,000 years. He's, keep, he's still waiting. Turn to him. If you're in a marriage and you're unhappy, it's so easy to say, oh man, if I just was married to somebody else, life would be better. Guess what? If you did, it would be better in some, those areas that the person that you're with is deficient and it'll be worse in other areas because the other person you get into is just as flawed. Turn to him. 
Turn to the one relationship that won't fail you, who will always love you and never let you down. Last thing I'll say there here is this. If you want to apply this, if you're single right now, and you th- are realizing that marriage is, if this is saying marriage is not trying to just find Mr. Right or Mrs. Right, there's a uh, Lewis Meads, you always marry the wrong person. And whoever you marry, you ch- they're going to change five times, and you're going to change five times. If that's actually true, and, and marriage is about mutual serving each other as the gospel unfolds in each other's lives, then first, if you're single, you can actually do this with friends and family and community. You can do this with anyone. But also, if there's people that you've probably categorically said, you walk into a room and say, that person's not for me because they don't live up to your specifications, it's possible that they actually were good marriage material because you know why? Because they would point you to Jesus. Maybe they would be the best people to actually do it. They might not be 6'5 or blue-eyed. They might not have, uh, you know, great social skills. But they love Jesus, and they would help you love Jesus. If you're married, many married people, what they do sometimes is when they get married in the city, they find each other here. When, when it's time to have kids, they leave. And, they, they, and I think the reason why to some level is they think that they still have this view of what it looks like to actually raise kids. They think that there, there's still this sort of expectation. And I'm going to quote my father at this point. He says this. He says, the city is messy, which is why a lot of people leave. But once you understand the gospel, you realize you're a mess, and you've married a mess, and now you're giving birth to little messes. <laughs> uh, he was talking about my brothers, not me. Um, <laughs> But his point was this, is that once you realize that marriage is about messy service and, and then there, therefore you can serve in messy spaces, then that means that you can serve here and be here and do it together. We would love to do it together with you. But let marriage point you past itself to him. Root yourself in him. And let's live out lives in that way in, of service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is hard stuff because this is not how we're formed. This is not how we're, we're taught. We're so scared because we've been so hurt before by others. Father, I pray that we can take our fears and cares and put them at your feet. Help us to see this profound mystery that as soon as our, our, our defenses go up, we hear all this stuff about submission and service. Help us to see, oh wait, this is the nature of you. Thank you for serving and loving us. Thank you for letting us, as, as, when we put you who served us first at the core of our lives, it turns us into agents of service, which are just agents of love, because love is service, Father. And I just, I confess that I myself have not always been that in my marriage, in my life. Help me to root my life further into you. I pray that everybody in this room can do the same, no matter what they believe. Convict us to move out in service because you first loved us and brought us home. Amen.